Okay, so hello everybody. Thank you all for joining us today in another episode of the IEA's Fusion Breakthroughs webinar. For those who missed the previous episodes, I'll put the links on the chat and in the comments below, depending on whether you are watching us live or on YouTube. Before we begin our session today, let me wel warmly welcome our two speakers who kindly have kindly devoted their time to present to us today about breakthroughs and fusion at their companies and hopefully answer any questions you may have. Our speakers today are Dr. Artem Smirnov, the Chief Technological Officer at TAE Technologies in the USA, and Dr. Michelle Leverge, Founder and Chief Scientific Officer at General Fusion in Canada. We again uh, thank them today for their availability. My name is Adam Danuovic, working at the International Atomic Energy Agency, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Here at the IEA, we work to foster collaboration and coordination on fusion R&D and move forward in developing the peaceful use of fusion and energy. We've been doing this work since 1958. This October, we will be organizing the 29th Fusion Energy Conference in London. Registrations are still open for this, for those interested. And in today's session, uh, we'll be featuring an overview of recent results from TAE Technologies, whose fusion approach re relies on field reverse configuration plasmas. The company was founded in 1998 with over 100 with over 1,100 patents granted, $1.2 billion in private capital raised, and five generations of devices built, along with two more in development. The talk will include an overview of recent experimental results from their current experimental machine, CTW, aka Norman, along with TAE's plans for the next phase devices. We will then hear from General Fusion, who are developing magnetized target fusion. A spherical tokamak is created inside a rotating liquid metal cavity, after which pistons driven by high pressure gas compress the fluid and the plasmas to fusion conditions. The company claims no expensive technologies are used, leading to a more cost-effective solution. Results, results so far and plans forwards will be discussed. We're, we're about to hear about these topics. The format will be a sequence of two talks, 30 minutes each, followed by a 30 minute Q&A session at the end. Please type your comments in the chat box and to whom it's addressed to, and we'll go through the question at the end in the 30-minute Q&A session. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Artem Smirnov, the Chief, Te Chief Technological Officer from TAE Technologies. Thank you, Adam, for the introduction, and thank you for the opportunity um, to speak in front of this esteemed group of people. I appreciate it. How's my audio? Still good? Yes, everything sounds good. Let me share my screen. And we should be in the presenter mode, right? You guys, you guys see the landing page. Excellent. So first of all, a huge thank you to all of you and the entire plasma physics community. Um, for laying a great foundation for our research at TAE. Uh, we're definitely standing on the shoulders of giants who came before us in the field. And without all of your work and contributions, um, our progress would not have been possible. So huge thank you to everyone. And also internally to our investors and the team, of course, I'm here representing the team of now over 500. So. Um, um, Adam was kind enough to mention a few of his bits of trivia, so uh, that makes my job easier. So, as many of you know, TAE uh, was founded 25 years ago. We were a spin off of UC Irvine, University of Californ California here in Irvine, um, with the mission to uh, commercialize practical fusion power and deliver. Uh, fusion derived technologies to solve existential human challenges. Uh, we've built a couple of generations of uh, national lab scale devices, which I'll describe later. We uh, made quite a bit of progress with our approach to fusion and validating that in the lab. We set up a lot of fruitful collaborations with many national labs and universities, both domestically here in the US and uh, internationally. And for those of you who are interested, all of our research publications could be found on our website on the research library at TA.com, where we have a couple hundred of um, uh, peer-reviewed 
uh, journal articles, as well as several hundred research posters, conference proceedings. So all of it is there. So please check it out. Well, the reason why we're doing what we're doing is because, as all of you know, the global energy demand is rising. And the uh, electric power uh, forecast uh, uh, predicts that uh, the worldwide consumption will double over the next couple of decades. And that's a problem because we need a stable and carbon free source of baseball power. And fusion is an excellent candidate for that. We at TAE strongly believe that fusion, just like the space race, can um, spur on a lot of innovations in adjacent fields. And from our pursuits of clean fusion, we spun out a company called TAE Life Sciences, which is which has taken our particle accelerator technology into the cancer. Um, uh, radiotherapy space quite successfully. And if we uh, have a little bit of time at the end, I, I can talk about that briefly. And more recently, we spun out our power management technology um, into the electric vehicle and residential and commercial uh, energy uh, storage markets. And this is just a couple of examples of how fusion can create tremendous value for investors and society more broadly right now be, be, before we even conclude this quest to clean fusion power which you know, still is so sort of at least a decade away so i'm going to talk today about the vision and roadmap i'll uh, give you an overview of the key program achievements we'll talk about next steps and then if we don't run out of time at the end i can say a few words about the spin-offs so as you know tae um, is in pursuit of the aneutronic fusion so-called aneutronic and the philosophy for that uh, has always been you know beginning with the end in mind we strongly believe that practical solution for fusion would come as a confluence of three sets of factors um, the, the scientific category um, where of course we need um, a solution that um, provides the appropriate plasma performance characteristics but but also we need a solution which where engineering uh, is tractable and doesn't present immense challenges. And the aneutronic path certainly is attractive from that perspective. And also we need fusion ultimately to be cost competitive and, and just commercially viable. And that requires relatively compact size, uh, small environmental in, impact. And um, it, it is the overlap of, of, of these three sets of drivers which dictates what what would be uh, a practical approach now our ultimate goal is proton born 11 fusion and um, this it, reaction itself is a neutronic but of course as you know there are some secondary reactions here in the mix which come into play so that some neutrons will be produced now uh, there's been some debate recently as to what can be legitimately called a neutronic and what not well in, in PB11 case, it's less than 1% of output power comes in the form of neutrons. And in the US, interestingly, some states actually uh, adopted uh, this definition that less than 1% is called a neutronic. So we're just following that definition. But of course, the, the uh, drastic reduction of neutron production simplifies the engineering and just alleviates many of the uh, severe problems that uh, the DT path is facing. Uh, hydrogen boron is a very benign and readily available fuel, uh, produces very little radioactive waste. Um, the, the good news is that the cross section for this reaction is actually larger than was previously believed to be. On the top right here, there are some measurements that we did about 10 years ago. Um, and there was a whole research dedicated to validating the cross sections. They, they are larger. 
Now, if you do accurate kinetic modeling, which we've published a couple of, published a couple of years ago, you will uh, realize that, well, the, 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 the preconception that PB11 cannot ignite uh, is actually false. Uh, it, it can ignite, although the margin, as you can see on the bottom right, is, is very, of course, very weak. And that's not practically, that's not even the point. It will always have to work as an amplifier. But the, the, there are nonetheless some very important new research findings uh, that, that, that validate the, the overall approach um, as published by us, as well as there is some excellent research coming out recently from Princeton where they they also uh, explore various kinetic effects and, and more subtle effects to um, offer pathways to more practical uh, PB11 um, fuel. Of course, uh, th this approach requires high temperatures and superior confinement, which remains to be validated. And we, through our series of experiments, uh, are trying to get there. So our approach is based on an FRC. Um, as you know, this is a high plasma beta configuration by design it's compact and offers a high power density um, it has large indigenous population of uh, large orbit particles and we enhance that by tangential neutral beam injection in the direction of this red arrow here um, just injecting neutral beams to drive uh, a toroidal in, in the tokamak uh, notation toroidal current here uh, whereas methyl in, in our nomenclature um, and this fast ion population it further increases the stability and reduces the transport in, in frc as, as, I'll, as i'll share some data later and uh, this configuration offers a, a radically simplified reactor design and maintenance uh, due to the simple geometry and uh, also the linear shape uh, offers the unrestricted diverter that facilitates power cash purity removal so there are some very tangible practical advantages that, that could be leveraged here and on our quest towards making pb11 practical we have built well depending on how you count uh, four generations i would say of of large devices um, right now we are in this green band um, with the device that called c2w we call it norman now we after the late founder of the company professor norman rostaker um, so norman has been in operation since 2016 and we actually achieved uh, the scientific goals that we set out for this device back in 2019 but then COVID happened and uh, uh, offered us uh, a bit more time of useful operation here. So we, we pushed Norman now so well beyond what we ever dreamed to accomplish with it. We're very happy with that. We achieved uh, uh, up to about 6 kV of total temperature in this plasma with now full active feedback control, uh, achieving very robust macro stability. And, and this really validates our uh, approach uh, well, at this level of performance, but in the fully collisional confinement regime, uh, collision-less, sorry, I may have misspoken, collision-less confinement, of course. Um, now, the next step we're aiming to take is this device called Copernicus. Um, it, it is in the final design now. We started the construction of the facility. We intend, uh, to start operating in 2025. And Copernicus is envisioned as a device that will operate only on hydrogen. We're not going to do DT, but we're aiming for a DT equivalent level of performance with a plasma temperature of about 15, maybe up to 20 keV and the appropriate confinement to ultimately be able to demonstrate Q equal one performance or close to that. And then, uh, and, and the reason why we're choosing to do it this way, well, I can talk about that later, but we see this uh, essentially, the, the market tells us that this would be a, a great 
licensing, technology licensing opportunity for us. TAE itself, we don't intend to do deuterium treating, but the others may want to take this approach and, and then complete, complete the DT device with it. We will march on beyond Copernicus to the device that we call Da Vinci, which uh, will be the first integrated hydrogen boron burning demo plan um, with hopefully net energy out to the tune of 50 megawatts. So it's relatively modest scale uh, device. Uh, we expect that this could be operational in the early 2030s. Now we accelerate innovation at TAE by building these experimental platforms uh, that offer fast uh, learning cycles uh, with machine upgrades and, and rapid prototyping. We heavily leverage the community uh, with strategic partnerships and resources and talent that we pool with, together with others, including, as I mentioned, University of National Labs, but also industrial players and commercial like Google and EPRI and many others. We heavily uh, lean on machine learning and AI in our operational optimization and with feedback control of the platform now. And we just in general take advantage of the uh, of the forcing functions and the environment that the privately funded space uh, imposes on us, which is we have to run fast and make make fast decisions and maintain a very high pace. Now let's talk uh, technology and, and science. So, so we started from from the early well devices, not quite tabletop, but transitioning from the tabletop to the bigger laboratory scale, and then um, from C one, C two, and with a few upgrades, we continuously push the performance of the FRC from you know in the early days, as as you as you may remember, uh, FRCs didn't last very long; they would crash and burn in flames in just a couple of hundred microseconds at best. This plot here just gives a simple metric of the configuration radius sustained over time, and this is milliseconds. So uh, as we started injecting beams and improving the fast particle confinement, uh, sustainment became better, and we were able to flatline our uh, FRC to about five milliseconds back. Uh, eight years ago in the device we called C2U. And then we upgraded it to what we now call Norman. And it's shown here. Um, I'll try to explain briefly how, how this whole experiment works. Well, it, it's a linear device, as you can tell. There's a human figure here for scale here, here, and here. I don't know if you guys, can you guys see my cursor at all on the screen? Uh, uh, Yes. Uh, so, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure. Uh, don't frequently use WebEx. <laughs> um, the, the cross section of, of the machine, the diagram up on top, shows uh, the contour lines. Th these are the few lines of the magnetic field. And uh, the, the color map is, I believe that's, that must be the temperature, actually. Um, but you can see the FRC is sitting in the middle, and then um, there's the guiding magnetic field with a couple of mirrors on each side. And then we have the formation sections. So the, the, the game, the, the shot starts in the formation section where we do fast data pinch reversal. We produce two CTs, compact toroids, and we slam them together by shooting them peristaltically with magnetic field, uh, with electromagnets. They collide and merge here in the middle and produce an FRC which then uh, takes this beam injection uh, tangentially. Uh, beams are aimed, aiming you know, off axis. They, they spin up uh, the FRC as mutually. And then the escaping plasma goes through two sets of diverters. We call these the inner diverters you know, towards the, the, the mid plane, closer to the mid plane, and then the outer diverters. They both have sets of bias electrodes, as we call them. These are concentric rings with high voltages applied to them that talk to those magnetic field lines 
and provide the E cross B plasma rotation, which, which conducts all the way to the mid plane, and we can create a sheared flow right sheared flow right outside of the separatrix, and that helps to stabilize global modes and reduce the transport. I'll show some data later. Uh, so th these are the main building blocks of the device. Um, now um, we we explored. FRC sustainment in fully collisionless regime in Norman. Sorry, this is a long laundry list. I'll, I'll focus our discussion on the bottom half of it, but let me just vocalize on what, what has been done so far. So we demonstrated that the fast time confinement in this plasma is close to classical. Um, we can now reliably and robustly control the stability and transport, the end biasing, and Fast time injection, there's actually a synergistic interplay there. Uh, we've achieved the total temperature over 6 kV with electron temperature approaching 1 kV. Uh, we can now sustain these plasmas for 40 or just over 40 milliseconds, which is limited only by the energy storage we have on site. Uh, we store the energy capacitively in, in all of our power supplies, which, by the way, you can, you know, those of you who have two screens open. In my background, that's a photo of the facility behind me there. And all those blue blue cabinets are, are the power supplies with the bottom half just um, being the energy storage. So we have a lot of stored energy on site. Um, recently, we demonstrated how the historical S star over E limit, I'll describe that later, which basically is the, the density limit in FRCs, which is set presumably by this internal tilt mode. We removed that. Uh, fast times completely uh, break through that ceiling and, and that opens up a much larger operating speed. We demonstrated the real-time active feedback magnetic control of the plasma shape and position, which again helps us uh, with the design of the next device, Copernicus. Um, now using the, all these bells and whistles, we can demonstrate the millisecond scale ramp up and heating in this plasma. And we believe that a favorable confinement scaling is emerging, which which now is extended to the collisionless regime, and and that offers maybe uh, quite a favorable scaling going forward. So we will focus and I'll, and I'll show some data supporting well about half of these claims here. You know, for the sake of time, we cannot possibly cover all of it. So I'll in the remaining time I'll just try to go very quickly to some data here so first of all how do we know all of this uh well norman is is a beautiful uh, very well diagnosed device so just some it's a mess i know but this is just to give the impression you know how much diagnostics we have there we have 74 diagnostic systems operational and more and the way some some of them by the way were uh, uh developed uh through the infuse grant program and I don't know if any of our collaborators are online here, but a huge thank you to our partners. We've uh, benefited immensely from the community and in, in building out our diagnostic capabilities. So, <clears throat> some, well, typical shot would look something like this now. Well, th this only goes up to about 30 milliseconds, but we can actually do more than that up to 40. We're actually preparing a couple of high profile publications now, so some, um, some visuals are under embargo. I cannot cannot share them, but they, they will be coming out uh, hopefully soon in, in our peer reviewed papers. So stay tuned. So th this is the uh, plasma diamagnetism, the, the, the separatrix size, the size, uh, the radial size. This is how we ramp the externally applied magnetic field. Total plasma temperature derived from the uh, power uh, from the pressure balance. And the neutron signal showing how fast ions accumulate towards uh, later phase of the discharge. And uh, we can see that fast ions clearly accumulate, the plasma is heating, uh, pressure is rising. And um, now we develop the active external uh, field and shape control uh, that, that allows us to build up this plasma and, and, and manipulate both the size and the the axial size, the radial extent of these uh, beasts. Now, with fast time accumulation, 
we then can run our uh, equilibrium reconstruction codes, which have been heavily benchmarked, and, and really validate the, um, the, the plasma entity that we create is fast time dominated. So this is a, a, a radial profile of the pressure and, and the breakdown between the thermal plasma, the fast time, and the external magnetic field. And, and you can see that fast times uh, dominate here. Um, and we don't see uh, evidence of any significant fast time driven uh, activities uh, to, to, to the extent that it would uh, affect the plasma performance, which is fortuitous and, and, and almost somewhat uh, surprising, but uh, we, we're, we're studying this uh, now and uh, well, this is this is one example um, of how the diagnostic suite allows us to understand what's going on inside. Um, we now fully embrace the the Bayesian uh, inference way of, of uh, uh, assessing the plasma behavior, meaning that we combine different diagnostics and and reconstruct uh, the the plasma state in the Bayesian sense, in the probabilistic sense, and that offers a much better accuracy of knowing what's going on inside. For example, uh, well, and, and that was developed in our partnership with Google. We've been successfully working with them over many years, and um, they brought their expertise and machine learning, AI, and uh, data algorithms. Uh, like, for example, in, in this particular uh, experiment, we reduce the beam power you know, somewhere in the middle of the discharge, just over 17, after 17.5 milliseconds. And you can see how some of the lower frequency modes, which were largely subdued before, they pop up out of non-existence. And then, well, here you will see that there is a bit more action on this. Uh, this is the uh, interferometry uh, reconstruction of the plasma density. Well, this is the Bayesian reconstruction relying on interferometry and a few other diagnostics. You can see how it starts bubbling up a little bit with M M equal one, two, three later in the discharge. Uh, just demonstrating that fast times actually stabilize, uh, well, help to stabilize some of these global modes. Well, this is another look of uh, what the plasma stability is like. Um, this is now this is a single diagnostic. This is just the reconstruction from interferometry with the black line showing the inferred separatrix radius from magnetics. And the bottom uh, panel uh, are the magnetic pickup coils, magnetic probes on the walls showing some global modes just appearing after the collision and merging, but then as soon as the bias system kicks in, they get subdued and then the, the plasma sits very in a very quiescent mode with just a few gauss you know, perturbations on the wall, which are benign, until we terminate the beams. Here the beams are switched off at 15, about 15 milliseconds. Now the bias system keeps going, but alone it's not sufficient and you, you see the, the violent n equal two just pops out of non existence and, and the plasma disrupts at that point now with all the fast time accumulation we uh we were able to completely undo the star over e limit um well many of you would be familiar that uh in the early days of the frc research i, I think it was rosenblum who predicted that uh, FRCs would be completely unstable to the internal tilt mode, which is M, M equal one, M equal one internal perturbation, just the magnetic moment flipping because it's oriented improperly in the relative to the externally applied field. Well, later on, it was understood that it, it, it actually this instability is is stabilized by a finite Larmor radius effects, but now with fast ion injection, we are basically uh, exploring these FLR effects on steroids. And you, you can see in, in the plot on the left here, how the S star over e, now S star is just the dimensionless parameters. It's the separatrix radius over the, uh, 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 the, the iron, iron gyro radius, basically, or the skin depth. 
and E is the elongation, is the, the aspect ratio of the length over diameter. So it, it used to be, you know, the, the historically the norm that the star over E would be limited by about three, and this essentially would be interpreted as as the limit on on FRC density because the star over E is proportional to the square square root of uh, density. Now with with beam injection, you see the more beam current we inject, uh, a star over E just grows linearly which intuitively makes sense. And uh, we achieve the star over E of well, instantaneous values of up to eight and nine. And, and this opens up quite a bit of operating space, which was previously inaccessible because the star over E limit essentially uh, couples density with the geometric parameters of the FRC. You know, if you have, if you have a certain density requirement, then your FRC would need to be just longer than a certain than a certain threshold value or, or, or the other way around now in copernicus you know in our next device we're going to use high energy beams up to 80 kilovolts and so we need a certain beam a certain plasma density for efficient capture well uh that sets a certain value of about mid 10 to the 19 uh, per cubic meter uh, but now we are completely decoupled with our geometry. We can we can do anything with with the radius and, and axial extent, and uh, this just opens up a whole new operating level of operating flexibility. Now, just very briefly uh, about our um, plasma feedback control. Uh, well, to ramp up the FRC, we need to increase internal pressure for fast ions uh, along with increasing the external pressure with uh, the externally applied magnetic field but as you start squeezing the frc it's just like a piece of soap which slips out of your hand you know top right diagram here shows how to start pressing it it wants to escape from you axially so you really need to control with your external magnets the the axial position, and that's what we're doing here. You see, you know, the, the, in the middle panel here, the uh, the centroid would escape from you axially if you just started pushing on the outside. Uh, instead, you, you you need to control uh, right to left uh, motion. That's what we're doing here with uh, on a millisecond time scale with external uh, magnetic coils, uh, and 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 this offers a way to control the FRC shape here you see that with coils uh, at the mid plane which is EQ1 and farther away from the mid plane EQ3 you know, by manipulating them in, in unison and, and running these feedback loops we can increase the radial size and, 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 and shrink the FRC at the same time or, or vice versa so uh, playing it uh, like an accordion and uh, this works beautifully with, with, with our plasma so with and without the active control, you can see that we we have shots which otherwise look uh, similar in, in terms of the radial extent, but we can radically increase the plasma length, for example. Um, and uh, the Z panel here shows how the centroid starts oscillating, but we're controlling it. And, and that allows to couple the beam power better and the total plasma energy, that's the bottom panel here, just keeps growing all the way until we run out of juice well again this is a 30 millisecond shot but we have we have this behavior now well validated all the way up to 40. we keep ramping at that time so we just we kind of run out of juice in the facility and, and we start hitting the limits of our built-in functionality uh, in the machine so just i think this this is my Two, two, two last slides. So first, um, we we started the, the transport in this device uh, uh, quite quite deeply, and especially with the recent upgrades in our Doppler backscattering system, we see some wonderful evidence of transport barriers. Um, how, for example, here. Oops, pardon me. I didn't mean to do that. Um, uh, here in this bottom panel, you can see how how the turbulence inside the FRC, inside the separatrix, is quenched, and the 
the zone of low E cross B shear is formed uh, just, just around the separatrix. And uh, th that, that offers a quiescent core and somewhat you know, turbulent open field lines uh, where the E cross B sheared flow driven by uh, the, the, the bias uh, system uh, can, can suppress the, the turbulence on, on the open field lines. So th this is fully consistent with our uh, uh, 3D turbulence simulations, which also find uh, quiescent core and, and, and turbulence developing on this open, open field lines. We published extensively on this. There's a whole series of papers on Fizz Plasmas and Nature Com. So I invite you to, those of you who are interested, to just uh, explore that. And, and, and finally, um, uh, an interesting confining scaling is emerging um, in our experiments. On the top panel, you can see the, the particle confinement time. And this is the old data you may have seen before. How now, previously, there was this uh, classical data pinch FRC scaling, and uh, our series of devices just took off vertically from there, uh, indicating that all these knobs like fast ions, bias, and, and mirrors also um, uh, make this a completely new confinement uh, scheme. And we see that the uh, energy confinement time, in particular here, featuring the electron energy confinement time in the bottom panel. In this collisionless regime uh, shows a, a very favorable uh, scaling with electron temperature. It uh, goes up as almost as T squared now. We don't know if this trend will uh, continue all the way, but um, a, a few measurements in different devices, modeling and zero D estimates, they all agree uh, you know, about this trend. And, we, we published on that before, and, and we are preparing publication now too. So this is all very interesting and promising data, which brings us to the next step. And I'll do it, you know, I think I'm running out of time here, so I'll, I'll, I'll make this my last slide, um, and we can save the rest for maybe the Q&A session. This is Copernicus. Uh, as I mentioned before, we intend to, uh, get into the DT relevant performance regimes with Copernicus, which uh, means that our ion temperature goal is 10 keV plus or more like 15. Uh, this will be a pulsed machine too, but with three second long pulses. We will run it also from capacitive energy storage, which is where uh, our T power management solutions now excel uh, by enabling that. Otherwise, we would need to look for a totally di different site for, for the machine. Um, this is in final design now. We started the facility construction, and we intend to start operating in 2025. And so hopefully more, more uh, exciting data will be coming from Copernicus that will support these trends. So uh, Adam, I, I think, I think Yes, I'm out of time, right? So yes, let, let's stop sharing here. Yeah, we, um, uh, you have more opportunities in the Q and A session. Yeah, after. this is this is fine. This is okay. Fine. So I guess uh, well, I, will, I, will, I will almost made it through the end. I think just I have just one more slide about um, spin-offs, but we can do that later. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So now let's welcome Dr. Michelle Leberge, the founder and chief scientific officer of General Fusion, based in Canada. I think you're muted. Hello, do you hear me now? Yes, now is good. Okay. All right, thank you very much. I'm Michel Aberge, the founder and chief scientific officer at General Fusion. Let's go in presentation mode, make it a bit bigger. Okay, so at General Fusion, what we intend to do is magnetize target fusion. Now, we didn't invent magnetized target fusion. That was developed a long time ago, say in the 70s. They were a program called Linus at the Naval Research Lab. And the idea is to put a plasma in a rotating liquid metal 
and then use compressed gas to push on pistons and compress the, the plasma with, with the liquid. Uh, there's a couple of very good advantage for this thing. There, there is a problem that in infusion in general, that it'll produce a lot of neutrons uh, for DT anyway, like a TAE try to avoid that with a different fuel, but the normal DT fuel will produce lots of neutrons that destroy the first wall, big problem. But here, the first wall is liquid metal, so it's not gonna get destroyed. If the liquid metal is kind of a couple of meters thick, there will be very little flux at the actual steel, and this is a very, very good solution to this problem. Another problem in DET is to breed the tritium. This machine, because the plasma is completely surrounded with liquid metal, it catch all the neutron. And if you use lead lithium, there's multiplication of the neutron by the lead, and you get a, get a breeding ratio of 1.4. So you produce actually quite a bit more tritium than you burn, so you can get the tritium going around. Also, there's the cost. Uh, here, there is no superconducting magnet, there's no neutral beam, there's no RF. Uh, it's very simple. It's gas pushing on piston, pushing on liquid. It's a simple technology, high pressure gas, valve, piston, the stuff you get in your car today. So we think that this can be produced at relatively low cost. And it's fairly easy to extract the heat because all the neutron will dump the heat in this liquid metal. So you pump this liquid metal, you throw it into a heat exchanger somewhere and make some steam. So this had a lot of good advantage. In the 70s, the plasma in the middle was not so good. The control of the piston for the symmetry it was a bit difficult, but now we have better technology. So at General Fusion, we took this idea and we keep uh, developing it. So what we want to do here is we want to spin a drum who the centrifugal force will put the liquid on the outside. There is a liquid shaft in the center. You open essentially a tap on the top and you, 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 know, you drip the liquid in the center. And in this shaft, we pass current. So the current goes down the shaft and up the liquid wall and it's a one-turn toroidal field coil, if you're a tokamak person. This will produce toroidal field. Then we inject the plasma with helicity injection. We don't produce the plasma the same way with the solenoid that uh, a normal tokamak do that. It'll be a picture a bit later to show a bit how that works, but we essentially, we, there's a plasma gun on top that shoot the plasma inside, and what you form is a spherical tokamak. And then you fire the piston around it, and it push on the liquid, and the liquid implode, increasing the, the parameter of the plasma, and at peak compression, you achieve enough uh, parameter to make the fusion. It's a big neutron flash, it'll heat the liquid, you pump this liquid out continuously, this will be a, a cycle, and we run this cycle about one time per second, and this is, this is what we want to do at General Fusion in general. Here's a little video to show that. So there's a drum spinning with liquid lithium. In the drum, there's other set of piston, and the cylinder of this piston is full with fluid. So the gas get compressed by the non-rotating outside piston and the rotating piston push the liquid in. And it's a little bit of a gap of, uh, of air of gas in between the rotating uh, cylinder and the thing. It'll be pictured a little bit later to show that a little bit you know, in a bit more detail. So this is a bunch of parameter that uh, the pre-compression and the post-compression. If you look at the pre-compression, it's a couple of times 10 to the 20th uh, density. This is if you look at the left column, it's a, a, a pretty dense plasma, but nothing too exotic. However, if you look at the right column, which is after compression, you will be see a pretty scary number there, like 100 Tesla or something. For the normal people with the DC coil, 100 Tesla is erisy. But here, what we do is we compress the flux. So you put a certain amount of magnetic field of the order of one Tesla in the middle, and when you compress it, the, because the flux is conserved, the magnetic field during the implosion does not have time to uh, to penetrate the liquid metal, uh, the, the plasma magnetic field goes very high. And with the very high, you can get the very high density. And with the very high density, you can get enough, uh, enough fusion. Uh, beta gets quite high, uh, near 50% beta. Spherical tokamak can go to those sort of uh, number, but uh, this, this, is, uh, this is due to the spherical tokamak. You need a good aspect ratio in order to get that. And one thing that's kind of nice is the confinement required to do that when we put in this model what confinement we, we put is about five times worse than what to achieve in a good uh, jet time tokamak. So we don't have to invent a better confinement. The, the confinement that plasma delivered today is acceptable for this scheme. And even we have some margin for that. A lot of other concepts require advance in confinement, which everybody knows pretty hard to do. This system, if the confinement scale properly at the very high energy density, uh, we don't need extra confinement. But this is a big if. 
we're going to push the parameter way higher than than usual. So we need to test that to make sure that the, the confinement remains good at those very high energy density. A uh, power plant will look like that. So you have to rebreed the tritium. You have to extract the tritium out of the flow of uh, liquid lead, me lead metal. And this is flowing continuously. It goes in the heat exchanger, makes some steam. The steam runs the turbine, some electricity to replace the capacitor bank that make the plasma. And what's important is a little, lot of recirculated energy to run the piston. But this recirculated energy comes straight from steam. We take the steam off the boiler and we push in the piston with steam. So that way we don't have to convert the energy into electricity, capacitor bank, you know, energy processing, RF heating, and, and those, those steps cost money, the equipment costs money, and you lose efficiency. Here with the recirculated energy in the steam is straight from steam, which allows us to have a cheaper recirculated energy and a more efficient one. Like for example, here this is a little bit of a something in my way. Okay. okay, so this is the sort of energy balance of the system. So according to little simulation, we find a fusion yield about 100 megajoule. But in order to put that, we have to put 500 megajoule of kinetic energy in the piston, which produce 100 megajoule of fusion yield. The breathing, the tritium breathing is exothermal. You get another 100 megajoule. Also, the plasma, you need 60 megajoule of capacitor bank to make the plasma. But when it goes in, uh, the plasma will disintegrate. Eventually, that's heat that will be dumped. We want to recover the energy of the piston. We want to compress this thing, and you push against the magnetic field. And the magnetic field push back out, and you recover this energy. We reckon from calculation that we recover about 400 megajoule. So all this thermal energy, like the, the balance between 500 and 400, actually go in heat because of viscosity and electrically loss like a resistance loss. So overall, all this thing goes in heat in the pot. You get about 700 megajoule of heat in the pot. You need 256 megajoule to reclaim your 100 megajoule thermal. This is the Carnot efficiency of about 40%. Spin the turbine, another 40% efficiency loss. Some of the electricity goes to turn on the pumps and the lights. Some of the electricity goes to recharge, and you end up with about 100 megajoule per, per thing. We typically try to sell two, two ball running one backhand, uh, we want to run that at about one hertz. So each ball will produce about, you know, 100 megajoule. At one hertz, 100 megawatt. You have two on them, that's 200 megawatt electric. So this is the overall energy balance uh, of the scheme. So this is all very nice. This is all computer simulation and PowerPoint presentation. But what have we done? So we have compressed the plasma with explosive. Here on the left, you can see how we form the plasma. There's a flux conserver on top. There's some flux uh, installed from a uh, coil, magnetic field, and you fire a big capacitor between the inner electrode and the outer electrode, and the, 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 the force from the magnetic push and stretch the, 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 the poloidal field coil, the poloidal field, like at the beginning here, and this gets pushed in the pot, it reconnects, and it forms the closed flux surfaces, and that's now a spherical tokamak. Now, on the right is what happened, whoops, is what happened when we compress it, So, here we go. So we put high explosive around the liner. We set up the high explosive. You can see the time going on the top there. It's about a 150 microsecond implosion. And you can see that as the liner come in, it compressed the plasma. And we have observed increase in, in plasma parameter during the implosion, which I'll show the data in a second. And then we compress, we compress. And we stop essentially when the liner touched the shaft because then it, it, it sprays some metal in the plasma and the game is over at that time. So it looks like that in the field. Uh, on the left, those are the capacitor and, and, and everything to drive the plasma. In the middle picture, you can see the, the flux conserver. We shoot the plasma inside this flux conserver. We put a big explosive. That's done in a field somewhere. You can see the nice tree over there. That's in BC. So the first time when we started doing that, uh, in the bottom right corner, those little circular target there, uh, this is the, the poloidal field as a function of toroidal position. We have like a 16 sensor at 16 toroidal direction, and the different circle are different time at later and later time. So you start with a nice symmetric plasma, but as you compress it, it goes unstable and you lose it. So that's a typical problem with plasma, it tends to go unstable. We learn over a bunch of explosion how to improve that, and on the right, is some of our latest explosion that we did. Do uh, you implode that and stay nice and symmetric? There's no uh, macroscopic instability during the implosion, which was a great success. 
Uh, here's the magnetic field as a function of time. We, all those explosions were different shots, and they didn't really start at the exact same magnetic field, so we normalized to one to be able to compare that. So you can see that the first explosion, there were actually no gain in magnetic field. There's a gap here in time because we actually changed the liner geometry. But you can see that PCS 16, for example, the magnetic field went up by a factor of eight, which is pretty close to what it was supposed to do, about nine, uh, considering the compression ratio before the, 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 the liner hit the shaft. So we, we managed to compress the plasma in a stable way, and the magnetic field increased. And here is the neutron count. This is neutron uh, per second as a function of time. In sort of orange there is for non-compression shot. So when we form the plasma, there's some neutrons, like, but we don't hit energy to this thing. We make the plasma and then it decays. So if we don't compress it, you can see that the heat goes down and the neutron rate goes down. However, if we compress it, it goes to gray sting. You can see that during the compression, there's an increase in the neutron uh, yield. If this is thermal, which you can argue that it may or may be not be thermal, that would correspond to an increased temperature from 200 eV to 800 eV during the compression. That's pretty good success. Now, we also work on the compression system, all those piston rattling thing. Uh, so here, what you see is a servo control system. You, you need a very good symmetry in this game. And if you push with a bunch of piston and they're not perfectly symmetric, you will not be a good implosion. Uh, implosion is tricky on symmetry. When it's that symmetric, it grows during the implosion. So the, the, the sort of orange dot is if the servo is off. And this is the time the piston arrive at the end of travel for different shot. And when you turn the servo on, it gives the blue dots. So you can see that this, this scattered and when the, the time of arrival of piston goes from 270 microseconds to seven microseconds, which according to calculation should be enough to achieve the symmetry we want. Uh, we build a little sphere like that with 14 of those pistons compressing some liquid lithium. So this was mostly engineering to know how to deal with liquid metal, like there was lots of freeze up, pipe get frozen, and you have to learn how to, to operate with this liquid metal, not that easy. And then we fired those pistons, but we didn't put plasma in the middle of that thing. That was uh, too small for that. Uh, this is a ring that we have uh, with a, a bunch of driver around it. And it shows a bit this idea of having the piston in the rotor. The, the upper part is the rotor, and you can see the piston around the rotor, those rotate. And inside those pistons is liquid. So when, when the gas push on those pistons, it implodes the liquid. And you can see the stator at the bottom with all the hole where the air comes from, and there's a bit of those valve and stuff on the backside. So the, the stator is fixed, the rotor rotate, there's a little bit gap in between. When you put some air in the gap, it push on the rotor piston that push the liquid in. That's the system. Uh, here's some result at peak compression. So the little red circle on the left picture is a tracking of the inner surface at peak compression. This was about uh, eight to one compression ratio, I believe, on this shot. Uh, on the upper right is we develop, we unroll that uh, numerically to make it linear, if you can see. And then this is delta R over R at peak compression. And, and you can see that the, the, the maximum deviation from around is 4.5%. And we reckon that this is enough error that we, we can do that. Uh, this didn't show up on the first shot, by the way. When you start shooting those things, you get the complete mess, very, very asymmetric. And then you can try to understand the computer, look at all that and adjusting. And eventually we, we achieve sufficient uh, symmetry. But symmetry is a big deal. That's a difficult thing to do. Uh, here's a multi-layer one. So the other one is a single layer. This is, we call it the CWC, the, the cylindrical water compressor. You can see on top of the first picture there, that's the rotor. Uh, this spin, this piston in that spin with the rotor, those, those cylinders are full with liquid, that's water actually in this machine. Outside is all the gas valve and everything to produce the gas. There's a gap in between the, the stator and the rotor and implode, but here we have many layers. So we can fire the top and bottom layer first to try to make a cup geometry, to try to trap the plasma in the cup and compress it. Because the cylindrical thing make a cylinder, and if you would just say cylindrical, the all compression, the, the elongation of the plasma would become too long and the plasma goes unstable. So what you need is the top and bottom to close faster than the middle in such a way that you make a cupping geometry to catch the plasma. So here we project laser on the surface of the fluid and we look with a, a, a video camera at, at those lines, and we can reconstruct the shape of the implosion with that. And we compare that to the model, and uh, we, we, we achieve nice symmetric implosion with uh, the proper cupping shape that we want, and it fits with the CFD model. So we're quite uh, confident now that we can control the surface of the liquid to the shape and symmetry that we want. 
uh, plasma injector. So we need to put a big plasma in there in the middle of this thing. So we've built this plasma injector here, which is a meter radius, like two meter diameter. It's a kind of a sphere. And about 10 megajoule of pulse power in there. We achieve about 300 EV in this thing. We achieve about 10 millisecond of energy confinement time. Now on the left here, the graph that you see is the polyol field as a function of time. It's important to understand that in those things, we put a big puff of energy to make the plasma, but we don't add energy. There's no heating, there's no nothing. There's ohmic heating that, that, that comes, but with, there's no external heating or source of power. So you can see the decay of the polyol field. And, and during the middle there, between five and 10 milliseconds, it's very flat. You can see we're not losing too much energy. And uh, we can calculate from the, the decay of energy and the temperature and the thermal energy and everything that we get about 10 milliseconds. And we want to compress in about five milliseconds. That's the, the prediction that we want to compress in the machine. So we now know that we have enough energy confinement at the beginning anyway, that if we compress it, it should go to the, to the performance we want. But we do not know that as compression proceed, if you can maintain this confinement. Uh, this is the temperature of the plasma from Thomson scattering at different uh, position. On the left is the magnetic axis. On the right is the edge. Uh, so you can see we have like 300 and a bit in the center, and it's fairly flat. And this is believed to believe because we evaporate lithium on the wall. So we have a gathering system at the wall. So there's very little recycling. And uh, this has been shown in other tokamak, and, and we see that too, that the temperature profile is relatively flat across the machine, which is good. Good thing to do. Uh, this is our energy confinement time compared to ITER 97. Uh, this is the L mode. Uh, so we kind of achieve performance similar to the L mode of ITER. So, so basically, the way we form our tokamak is a little exotic, but the tokamak we get is, is not special. It, it doesn't have any special, it's not, it's not even H mode, it's a, it's a fairly low. And we still think that this is enough to go to good condition if we compress it. Uh, slick. So this is a machine where we, we turn our explosive machine upside down and we put a pool of liquid lithium at the bottom. And what we do is we fire a current in the shaft and the lithium, because of the magnetic field, shoots up and it covers the bottom half of the machine. Then we fire the plasma in there and we're interested to know if the plasma is happy uh, when there's a liquid metal. Typically, we evaporate lithium on the wall, but it's a solid lithium. And our scheme rely on having a liquid lithium, and we say, hmm, maybe the liquid lithium will kill the plasma, which would be bad. So we do this experiment here. When the shaft current, we see the pool of liquid lithium at the bottom here. And when we shoot the current, this lithium goes up. And we let it go up to about the equator, because if it goes above the equator, then it uh, goes on the ports. And then you can't see what's going on, and all your sensor and diagnostic are, are shot. So we don't want to. It would be nice to cover the whole thing with lithium, but that will also cover all the diagnostics. So we, presently, we don't want to do that. So in dark green is what we achieve if we have a, a evaporated solid lithium on the wall. And in pale green is the liquid lithium. So this is just a magnetic field as a function of time. But you can see that the, the parameter of the plasma is actually a little better when you, uh, when you put liquid lithium. And other people have observed that it is the, the, the lithium tokamak at Princeton. They, they get good performance of that. So lots of people are lithium addict. They think that lithium is good for the plasma, which is good because we don't want to implode lithium on the machine. A uh, quick diagnostic. This is for the next machine we want to build, the, the big compressor. And uh, we, we, we have an array of diagnostic. It's not as big and as TAE, but uh, we have something that we think will be able to measure what's going on. It's a bit difficult in this situation because you cannot put anything on the outside. Like the liquid wall will block you. So all the diagnostics have to be inside. And at peak compression, you will only have the, the shaft in the center. So for this next machine we want to build, the shaft will not be liquid because we have to put sensor in it. Uh, the shaft will get broken at, uh, at high energy shot. So we have to put a different shaft with a different set diagnostic and implode it. In a, in, a, in a power plant, we would like a liquid shaft, but then it would be very little diagnostic access. It would be very difficult. For our next machine, we will put a solid shaft with diagnostic in it. Uh, we also make uh, some simulation and some uh, computer stuff. So the first thing we do is we call it the integrated model. It includes the valve and the air and the piston and the liquid. And there's a relatively simple liquid model in there. And this runs very fast. And it, like it takes, you know, 30 seconds to run or something. So you can optimize you know, how big should the piston be, uh, what the pressure should be, and things like that. And when you have one that you think you have descent, then you do some CFD. 
uh, we have uh, open foam, which we modified a bit to include the magnetic uh, force in it. And then that can uh, simulate the exact, but that takes longer to run. This is probably a day run to run those things. Uh, we have a, a collaboration with Quick Marie on that. Then we do a lot of NHD. We use a, a computer called VAC. Uh, we modified it to be able to deal with the surface that change. Well, most uh, MHD code are for a fixed box. When you start compressing the box, they travel with that. So. Uh, then you, the energy confinement time is uh, calculate with T gyro, C gyro from uh, general atomic. Uh, and then we have plasma stability uh, with decon. This is, uh, for instance, doing those calculations. What you see in the little graph is uh, as a function of compression with different characteristics. And what you need is you need to stay in the blue the whole way. So where it says, you know, back trajectory, it stays in the blue, it means stable. But you have to be a bit careful because if you're not at the right place during the implosion, you're gonna go unstable. But we, we found that we can actually find trajectory and initial plasma thing and the shape during the compression that stay stable during the implosion, according to DECOM. And then we do plasma wall interaction, especially near the center, the, the plasma gets very hot. There's a lot of energy. It, the wall is predicted to evaporate. Uh, the, the transport of this vapor metal into the plasma is very important. I, would, I call it a smoke problem. We don't want to smoke out the plasma. So the, the, the wall will evaporate and you have to try to calculate what the transport of this smoke going in. So far, it looks okay, but this is something that uh, we're still in progress right now. That's, uh, we're doing that with Oak Ridge. And finally, the, the structure of this machine takes quite a beating. It's very high pressure gas in there, so we do dynamic FEA, pretty standard engineering thing to make sure that we won't bend anything when we shoot. So the presently we do that with a whole bunch of existing code, and we kind of loosely couple them on a time step to time step. But uh, our, com our plasma our computer guys say that it's a bit Mickey Mouse and it would be nice to have a single code that have all those things included in one thing. So we want to develop this code called Pulsar and it will have all those bits, but in a single uh, grid, because sometimes you have to change from one grid to the other, cause some issues. Because at peak compression, we think it's gonna become pretty coupled, like the way the fluid move with the plasma move, it's all gonna be very coupled. So this loosely coupled different code that we do, like for example, the CFD for the liquid and the MHD for the, for the plasma, if we can put that in a single code, it would be better. All right, so now what are we gonna do next? So this is stuff we're doing right now. If, uh, if we get the financing for it that we're trying to do right now, we want to build this machine. So you see the little man in the bottom right corner, it's a pretty big machine. Uh, this is the same idea, so it's gonna be a spinning rotor with piston, but we scale that pretty big. And uh, so here's a simulation of, of the shape. This is what I was, you see, you see you fire the top and the bottom of liquid in red and makes a cupping geometry that traps the, the, the plasma in the center. So that's what we, we want to do in this machine. Uh, this is the iron temperature prediction. So it'll go to about 10 kV. There's the current. Uh, this doesn't show the, 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 the density, but this machine should start at about one time to the 20 and end up at about you know, one time to the 23 density. That's big density at 10 kV. So this is actually, this should produce about 10% of loss on if the confinement happen in the middle. The, the, big, the big uncertainty in this machine and in a general fusion approach is what will the confinement be at peak compression? We do those little scaling law and everything and it's okay, but nobody has measured plasma at those very high density. There's quite a bit of, of risk there and that's what we want to remove with this machine here. And this is uh, the magnetic field. You can see we have open field line uh, on the outside, the, the symmetry axis at the bottom here, and we compress that this way. So it's stay cup, like we, we, we have the, the, the outside compressing the thing and keeping it in the middle. So this is uh, the end of my presentation, I think. Let's see if we can get out of here. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I guess I will direct the first question to you, uh, Dr. Michel Leberge. And the first question would be, if you're using lead lithium as a compression medium, don't you have to worry about the lead getting into the plasma? Yes, this is a big concern. We are trying to calculate, and, and when we do the experiment, we'll have some idea of how much transport of the metal goes in the middle. Lead, of course, is terrible. Lithium is better. Uh, 
I'm scared of lead anyway. We haven't finished the calculation, so we don't know because the, the, the vapor gets ionized very quickly and then it's trapped by the magnetic field and then it's you know magnetic transport going on. If you think you're beating the, tra the heat transport, which is the, the stuff going out, you will also beat the stuff coming in. But uh, we need to show that. If it becomes to be too much of a problem, we have this half-baked idea of floating a thin liquid of lithium on the surface of the lead lithium. We need the lead lithium for the inertia to keep the thing together longer in the middle to achieve something. So we, we need the density of it, but we could have the surface being pure lithium to avoid this problem. But we, we don't really want to go there because it had complexity to the rig. But uh, if it turns out that lead is too much, which we don't know yet, we would do that. Okay, thank you. My next question to you, uh, Artem, would be, what thermal to beam to field reverse configuration efficiencies and circulating power fractions are assumed for the TAE reactor? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes, sorry, I had a bit of a problem here with my audio. Um, recirculating reactor powers. Well, it, it's, it's quite high. Um, I, I was just checking the numbers here. It's, uh, it's about 30% or so. I, I mean, to, to make these, I was, I was following the chat threads here. No, to, to make these a viable reactor, you, you of course would have to uh, harvest uh, Brimstralon, right? You, 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 do, you do want to harvest X-rays, absolutely. You cannot reject that. Um, and and with that, the the recirculating power would be quite high, but um, we can make our beams very efficient. We in fact built reactor prototypes, which uh, reactor prototype uh, level beams uh, at one megavolt uh, level injected energy, which can be eighty five to ninety percent efficient. So 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 the overall balance works fine. Uh, but of course, assuming assuming the uh, confinement is is in place to support it. Okay, thank you. My next question to Michelle Leberge would be: Has general fusion demonstrated stable reversible implosion of quasi spherical linear compression of a target? Example: a trapped gas. Uh, yes, we, we, we do shoot the liquid, and when it comes in the center, it reflects. Actually, if you look carefully, those little circles that I showed during my presentation, you can see that after the implosion, the circle go back up. On those machines, we don't have the rig to recover the energy. We, we don't have like the, the fancy valve and stuff to, re, to recharge. So really what they do is they go in and out and in and out and in and out and it bumps a couple of times and dies out. So we don't have the equipment to recover the energy, but we certainly see that the liquid rebound. Now we haven't got plasma or magnetic field in there. So what it rebounds on is we can put some gas to rebound some gas, but mostly it rebounds on the, on the rotation. In order for this thing to be RT unstable, you need the rotation centrifugal acceleration to be higher than the radial acceleration like this. So in all those experiments, if you want to go a good experiment, you have to spin it fast enough compared to the implosion velocity so it bounces off the, we call it bouncing off the rotation. That's, that's what bounces off. Now, sometimes we put gas in there, but if you put too much gas, so it, it starts to rebound on gas more than on the rotation, then it goes RT unstable, and you see all those little finger and stuff going on. So, uh, yes, we've seen reflection, but we have not recovered the energy because we have not built the gear to do so. Okay, thank you. My next question is to Artem. As you apply more and more neutral beam injection, fast particles, do you see any kinetic alpha instabilities? Yes, we believe we do see it. Uh, and, and thanks thanks for the question, Glenn. Um, it's, uh, we're trying to understand w w what exactly we're seeing now. We're running some um, uh, Exim simulations, which uh, which is a peak road, uh, you know, as many of you may know. Um, and it, it seems that the, the alphenic, uh, alphenic modes and alphenic driven reconnection should be there. Now we're just trying to 
formulate experimental hypotheses on, 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 on what to test for in the experiment. But what we see doesn't seem to lead to any uh, performance, you know, significant performance deterioration. So maybe we're not there yet, but uh, we'll, yeah, we're exploring. Stay tuned. Thank you. My next question to Michelle Leberge is, um, how are you handling the repeated application of very high magnetic fields on the center conductor of your tokenback like arrangement? Yes, so right now for the machine that we want to build, the pressure will be so high that it will destroy the shaft. So we have to put a new one on each explosion. Not very good for power plant. Power plant be a liquid. When the maximum compression happens, the shaft will go unstable and everything. We calculate that the gross rate of stability is good enough compared to the implosion time. But uh, after the shot, it will keep like, you know, we expand, but the shaft will keep bringing it, the shaft will disappear. It'll, it'll get wiped out. But you, you have a tap here, buying a vertical jet of liquid metal. So all this twisty shaft will fall off the bottom of the pot and a new shaft will be created. And we want to do that at one second time rate. So basically people from the question, they're worried that the magnetic field will mess the shaft. Well, it will but that we'll put a new one, be it liquid or be it solid. Solid is a pain, we have to go slow and put a new one, but in the power plant, we want a liquid one that will get wiped out every shot, but it will reconstitute as, a, as the jet keep pushing down. Okay, thank you. My next question would be, uh, back to Artem, is what is keeping the electron temperature so low compared to the total temperature? Well, it, it's kept at whatever level it's binding self consistently. Uh, I guess a generic answer to 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 the question: if if uh, we, we bring power in, it, it finds a balance. So the power in is uh, counterbalanced by losses, right? So um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say that it. it keeps it that low, one keV is a very respectable temperature for a mirror device with uh, the power uh, with the heating capacity that, that we have. Um, we inject a couple of megawatts of uh, power, which mostly goes into the electron channel and our losses are mostly convective as we know. They actually uh, pretty well plugged. We've done a great job with our expander diverters. So we measured that the uh, the energy loss is about six uh, to seven uh, temperatures, uh, which is very close to the uh, ideal limit. So um, all of that self consistently establishes the electron temperature approaching kilovolts. So, it's my long answer to, to how the electron power balance works. Okay. Back to Michelle Leberge. Following up from the from your previous answer, how would such instabilities in the shaft affect the plasma itself? Do you worry about that? Yes. Not only the shaft, but also the outside. Like the outside liner will develop some asymmetry. The shaft will start to bend. So so as you compress the whole thing will start to be a little asymmetric. We're, we're trying to tackle that with simulation right now. And I would have to say that we haven't gotten an answer right now because most of our code are cylindrical symmetry. So now you run that in 3D to try to figure out what's, what level of unroundness will affect the transport. Like how much transport do you lose when the things start to be asymmetric because the shafts start to bend or the outsides are. And we don't have an answer for that exactly. We, we're working on this. Like typically in the tokamak people, they are very careful with their magnetic field. They think that you know, 10 to minus three magnetic field errors start to increase, but that's an external magnetic field. Here's the liner. So the plasma will always adjust a little bit to the liner because it's reflecting uh, current in the liner. So it's not totally clear to us at this point what's the maximum error that we can uh, accept and that won't, you know, what the effect of a certain amount of error on the transport. So we're, we're working on that numerically. And when we start shooting this machine, we will get some answer. But uh, at this point, we don't know that exactly. Okay, thank you. So back to Artem, 
have you been able to raise the magnetic field from 0 0.1 Tesla uh, to higher values in you know, in the CTW reactor? Yeah, yeah. We used to operate actually below kilogauss. We used to be somewhere at 750, 100 gauss. And we basically doubled it. We can go to about 1.5 now, which is you know, B squared four times what it used to be. So yeah, to that level, yeah, we can. My next question is, uh, with alpha particle deposition, the effective beta of the plasma target increases. What happens to the plasma stability for reactor level nuclear gains? That's the Michelle Leberge. Ah, yes. So that's a good question. When, when we want to produce those yield enough to show the little diagram that I showed at the beginning, included in there is alpha eating. And the alpha eating is a sizable amount of the increase in thing. However, when the alpha start eating, we over beta. Like we will go over the, the maximum beta than the than the plasma can take. In experiment in normal tokamak, the, 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 there's two ways that this fail. Some people try to put some more heating in there, and the, the, the confinement degrade, and the extra heat escape. That would be okay with us. Basically, it would make a, a clip, like at 50% beta, any other energy would just go away to the wall and that'd be accessible. However, sometimes when you over beta, it goes unstable and you lose the configuration loop. That will not be acceptable. So at this point, it is not clear to us when we over beta, will it go unstable and we lose it or will it graciously, the, the confinement will decrease and the extra heat will escape, which we would like. If the situation and it goes unstable, we could conceivably put some impurity in it, some AIZ impurity, that when the temperature increases, they radiate more. And you control your peak beta with radiation. Like you, if the heat goes too high, then you radiate more and then it's stabilized. So you, you might want to get rid of the extra heat with radiation by putting impurity, or the extra heat will escape by increased transport naturally from the machine. But if the case is that when you over beta, it goes unstable, and uh, that would not be good. Okay, thank you. My next question is regarding the neutral beam injector. How much recirculating power as a fraction do you think you will have in the reactor and what efficiency does this require? Uh, since traditional efficiency is usually no more than a third and what sort of developments will be required in the NVI for, for future reactors? Okay, well, I guess we touched on that briefly before, but um, we have been researching and developing beams for 15 years now, both positive ion based and negative ion based. And uh, as I mentioned before, we prototyped uh, megavolt level beams with ampere level currents for our uh, future um, PV11 reactor. So uh, we're very comfortable with the approach we're taking. As far as uh, beam efficiency is concerned, uh, well, to, to support the practical reactor, you of course would like to do better than the gas neutralizer, for sure. And there's a couple of options. Uh, there's a plasma neutralizer, which can be up to about 85% efficient, demonstrated experimentally. Uh, or you could, if you are ambitious and could do even, you know, want to do even better, you could do uh, a photon neutralizer, uh, which is a very cool process where you can detach a, a loosely bound electron to the H minus uh, accelerated ion with light. And by the way, there is no, there is no opposing process. Uh, unlike gas and plasma, so not, you know, photons don't see the electrons back. So it's very efficient and you could actually get over 90% efficiency, which again, in smaller laboratory setups, we demonstrated. So uh, we're very comfortable that we can do at least 80, 85% efficient beams. Okay. At, at megavolt level. Well, thank That's you, Artem. Uh, you also mentioned in your presentation about spin-off technologies and um, that, TAE has been developing. So if, if you'd like to touch upon them and then 
we might move on to Michelle afterwards if he also has any spin off technologies that General Fusion is developing. Sure, I'd love to. Oh, you're very generous. Uh, let me just uh, bring up uh, my slides back if, 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 if that's okay. No problem. Uh, there is. All right, so we are on Beyond Fusion and spin off technologies, right? Uh, and I can. Um, so our first spin-off was with our accelerator technology, which leveraged all that development work that, that I just commented on in the negative ion beam space in particular. Um, and we developed a, an electrostatic beam, uh, which uses tandem, tandem accelerator, uh, platform, um, at about, well, of course, this is a very different beam than what we use in fusion. This is higher energy, about two over two megavolts total energy with just about 10 to 15 milliamps of current. So much less current, higher energy. Uh, to, to produce, uh, to develop a neutron source, produce neutrons by converting protons beams into, into, into neutrons for the cancer treatment modality, which is called boron neutron capture therapy. It's a unique cancer treatment technology, which uh, is a combined therapy where the therapeutic effect is produced by the drug uh, and the, the neutron uh, radiation. You can think of it as um, neutrons triggering the, the action of the drug, which of course just uh, boron 10 capturing neutrons and sending an alpha particle out, which kills uh, that cancer cell, but not the healthy cell next door due to the vector action of the drug that pumps boron 10 preferentially into the cancer cells. So uh, it's a very efficient way of killing cancer, very highly selective. Uh, uh, the, the other way to think of this is a, it's like a biomedically targeted radiation therapy, as opposed to physically targeted radiation therapy, like x-rays or protons, which all have physical limits on accuracy. This now has biomedical, Limits, cellular limits of accuracy. We started treating patients late late last year. We so far treated 14 patients and uh, with pretty great clinical results so far. Of course, the observation period is not very long yet, but the immediate response of those patients is uh, terrific. And we're growing the order book for TE Life Sciences in US, Europe, and Asia. So that's that. And, and our more recent spin off. It, it had to do uh, like any invention and grew out of necessity. <laughs> we, for those of you uh, uh, who may have visited us or, or know our, uh, our facility here, we operate in a very inconspicuous commercial campus in Southern California. The energy feed, the power feed into our building is very limited, it's just a couple of megawatts, whereas the experiment takes many hundreds of megawatts in that short pulse of 40 milliseconds or so. So we had to develop technology to store energy on site capacitively and then very efficiently on a millisecond time scale channel it in and out of our uh, capacitors and batteries and uh, very efficiently managing that power, those power flows into all of our electric, electromagnetic loads. And once that was developed with all the uh, power electronic circuitry and topology and control networks and algorithms, then we realized that it has the same technology because it's very modular and, and very scalable. It has applications, for example, in electric vehicles. It turns out both on board with, with the powertrain and on the charging side of the EV and can produce very meaningful improvements to the vehicle range, longevity of parts, um, operating characteristics of the vehicle. And uh, also this can go into residential and commercial energy storage applications, which is we've, uh, we've further developed these now outside of our fusion experiments and spun out T Power Solutions, the name of the company. And it's uh, addressing a trillion dollar size market right now with all the EV and storage applications. That's that's the uh, uh, side application story for us. That's all I got. 
so mm-hmm. I guess I'll give the floor to Michelle if he has any um, similar spin off or comment in that regard. Okay, so a general fusion making spin off of different pieces of technology was often discussed, and I personally resisted uh, quite strongly doing th- those spin off because, in my opinion, it will distract us from doing fusion. I, I just started general fusion because I wanted to, you know, deliver fusion to humankind, solve all big problem there. So in my opinion, if we start building spin-off, like some fraction of the personnel involved with the spin-off will have to go with a spin-off too. So I, I thought it would be a distraction to do so. Now, the investor like it because, you know, in case your fusion doesn't work, you still have something. So there's some discussion that perhaps we should have done fusion uh, uh, spin-off, but uh, so far general fusion have not. And I have been resisting. I think we should do fusion. That's the idea. Well, thank you. I guess we have a few more minutes, so I'll find some more questions in the chat. I guess one more question to Artem would be regarding earlier, regarding the S S star parameter. And the question is, is that based on uh, the beam ions or or some average ion energy? Um, the, the that plot that I that I shared before, that's S star uh, for the for the thermal plasma. The whole point is that, you know, if you have no fast times, then a star over E, as con- conventionally defined, would you know, generally you would operate over, uh, a star over E less than three or just about three. Well, fast times break that conventional limit and, and, and definition. So, yeah, it's the conventionally defined a star. Okay, thank you very much. Given this, uh, let me double check. I have one more question for general fusion regarding the plasma aspect ratios and simulations and whether uh, that increases during uh, compression or does it remain constant throughout as this would affect the uh, high beta attributes? Uh, it changes. Like uh, we try to maintain it as much as possible, but due to the maximum copiness that we can put in the fluid, if we do too much, it starts to produce jet at the equator, actually. So we cannot cop too much. So within the limit of what the fluid can take, the, the aspect ratio increase. I can't remember the number, but let's say from 1.5 to 2 or something like that for the K, aspect ratio, the elongation factor. Uh, this stays stable. We do check with Decon that the plasma stays stable. It affects the transport when you put those different at a K into the little equation, like the gyro code, it, it changed it. But all that is included in our, in our simulation. So it's, it appeared that it should still work. Yes, it affects beta, beta change with the elongation, all that. This, this is all in the system and it, it works in the computer. Yeah, remain to be seen if it'll work when we actually shoot. But uh, yes, the elongation change but uh, it's included in the calculation and it should still work. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one more question just uh, showed up. Uh, so General Fusion has announced that a reactor project is being built in the UK now, which is, is that correct? And the follow-up question is, is TA Systems considering building something outside of the US or is it currently confined uh, geographic to, geographically? Where you are now the the plan is the uk but it's subject of financing we're presently in financing mode trying to finance this big machine so no money show up no no machine no money no machine big money big machine and now to autumn uh well i i i fully second michelle's statement uh, uh <laughs> big money big machine no money no machine so that, that's that's generally true. Uh, no, look, we we, we are TA is is, is exploring uh, a, a few a few opportunities outside of the U.S. We are uh, we, we're having our dialogues open with various uh, parties. Uh, um, it, it's 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 a huge commitment for, for the company and. Of course, we would need to scale uh, accordingly. We, we, we are fully committed to Copernicus. It is being built here. 
Now, if we find a, uh, and we will be open, we are open to the ideas of uh, accelerating the path to practical fusion and uh, provided that, that there are committed and, and motivated partners and, and financing can be shored up, then we can certainly support parallel activities or staggered activities where maybe we can accelerate Da Vinci uh, while Copernicus is still operated. So yeah, so those conversations are taking place. Oh, thank you. Thank you to both of you panelists for contributing. So, um, you know, contributing your time, contributing your time and knowledge to this presentation and and again, answering all the questions within the comments uh, regarding your presentation, I guess uh, we could take away that you know that we hope we hope to see you know more results in the future, and I'm sure to the audience you, we encourage them to follow along their respective websites and more information in the future from both of the companies. So thank you very much to both speakers and. Thank you for answering the questions and we hope to see you, the audience in future episodes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate and, uh, the opportunity. Thanks, thanks for the for audience for some questions. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye.